I'm going to change the tech a little bit and ask this question to us as we start. Have you ever done something deeply shameful that you wish you had never done and found yourself sometimes paralyzed by feelings of guilt and regret that can be very burdensome and discouraging? Now, to be clear, I think uh, feelings of guilt is not always bad. We live in such an emotion-driven age. Any sort of negative emotion is automatically considered to be bad. So, you know, you feel bad. Oh, you shouldn't feel that bad. Uh, um, but don't feel bad about yourself. That's the sort of the natural reaction and advice we get. But, you know, feeling bad about bad things you've done is not always bad. <laughs> Our first thing to do if you feel guilty is to assess whether you are guilty, in fact. Uh, whether there are unconfessed sins, uh, hidden sins underneath that you need to bring it forward before the Lord uh, and, and deal with the people that you have hurt, hurt uh, uh, in your sins. Having said that, however, there are times when you've done uh, uh, what you've done in the past is so traumatic. Though you've confessed your sins and done what you could do about the past, the past can really haunt you uh, with guilt that you just can't seem to shake off. A deep sense of regret leaves you feeling like you are forever marked by it. Uh, so you wonder in the privacy of your own heart, is my past just too corrupt to move forward? Uh, is there any hope for me? Uh, is there a, any real new beginning possible for me? I wonder whether there's any of you uh, who wrestle with those questions, uh, whether now or in the past. Uh, I think that's how the post-exilic community in Zechariah's day uh, probably felt. They had a traumatic past, to say the very least. Uh, can you imagine what it would be like to be destroyed and conquered? to be taken to a foreign land as slaves and to lose everything that was precious to you, everything that made your personal, national, cultural identity, and all because of your sins. And you knew very well away that it was your fault. And even though you were told by these prophets, uh, you were able to come back to the land, you were told and assured by these prophets saying, God has now forgiven you, uh, God is asking you to now return and start a new beginning, uh, there would have been a persistent sense of guilt and shame and regret and the self-doubt. Can we serve God after all that's been done? What if? Uh, what if God is still angry with us? Uh, what if there are sins that's yet to be dealt with? Uh, what if we are actually beyond repair to be any useful for God's service? That voice of accusation uh, leaving you paralyzed in fear. And, and I think, I'm guessing that's probably why they also, that's one of the reasons why they stopped rebuilding the temple for 20 years since coming back. Not much has happened for the last 20 years, even though they had returned to Jerusalem. Now, in answer to these doubts and fears, self-loathing and regrets and self-doubting, God assures his traumatized people through his dealings with the high priest Joshua in today's passage. But before we get into the passage per se, uh, why the high priest? You've got to ask that question, why? Right? Uh, why is the high priest highlighted? Uh, we modern readers are not familiar or particularly interested in priesthood, uh, especially in our Protestant circles. Uh, but priests were an essential group of the people in the Old Testament. I might want to say, in the Old Testament, priests were more important than kings and had a, a, a longer pedigree. You know, kings start in 1 Samuel, and in the middle way through 1 Samuel, uh, priests start in Exodus. As soon as they are uh, uh, um, brought out of slavery in Egypt, God appoints high priests because high priests were essential if any group of sinful people are going to have a relationship with God. Uh, it was through the mediation of the priest at the temple by confession of sins and offering of sacrifice, reconciliation with God happened. Without priests, it was not possible for people to have ongoing relationship with God. 
So Joshua the high priest here stands for the problem of Israel's sin and guilt in this vision and what God will do about it. If Joshua the high priest is rejected, that means the people are rejected. But if Joshua the high priest is reinstated, recommissioned, well, the people also have a future with him. And if Joshua stands for Israel, I want to say Israel stands for you and I. Why? Because Israel was called to be, do you remember? A kingdom of priests, Exodus chapter 19, verse 6. It was actually through Israel, all the nations were to receive God's mercy and blessing. So if Israel fails in their priesthood, well, our future hangs on it. So, so what happens to Joshua in this vision, even though it, you might say it's a one man, uh, but what happens to him has a huge ramification and implication for all of us and our relationship with God. So with that in mind, I'm going to look at today's passage in three sections. Joshua accused and defended in verses 1 to 3. Joshua cleansed and commissioned in verse 4 to 7. Promise of a greater Joshua in verses 8 to 10. At verse 1. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. Uh, the high priest standing uh, is a phrase often used when a priest is performing priestly duties, uh, uh, standing in the temple to offer sacrifices into God's sanctuary. So perhaps the vision shows us Joshua getting ready to offer sacrifice on behalf of people's sin. The same phrase, however, is also used to describe a judicial proceeding where a man is on a trial. He stands before the judgment throne. So it's as though with this little word standing, and, and you'll notice that the word standing actually repeats a number of times in these few verses. Uh, the narrator is saying, this vision is saying, Joshua is on his way to offer sacrifices, but then he stands accused before God and was asked whether he is suitable, whether he is acceptable to offer sacrifice. It's almost as though what began as a ministry ends up as a judgment. Joshua looks to his right hand, and right hand in the Old Testament, or even in English language, you look to right hand for help and assistance. But for in this instance, for this high priest, on his right hand is not angel of assistance, but Satan accusing him. Who do you think you are? to offer sacrifices to God. You are filthy, sinful, unclean. Have you forgotten what you have done in the exile or how you went into exile in the first place? Do you think you will be accepted before God? Don't be so stupid to think about going to church or going back to church after all that you've done. You don't belong there. The Hebrew word Satan or Satan means adversary. And the name makes it all too clear the purpose of devil with regard to both God and man. Uh, scripture says many things about the devil. Uh, most importantly, he's the deceiver in Genesis chapter 3 verse 4. He's the tempter in Matthew chapter 4 verse 3. He's a murderer in John chapter 8 verse 44. Uh, Satan cast as an angel of light when he's deceiving us, seducing us against God's will. So in, you remember in Genesis scene, in Genesis chapter 3, he comes to uh, Eve and, and he cast as an angel of light. Did God really say, look how beautiful it is, look how delicious it is. And if you eat it, you will become like God. But once you fall into his trap, he becomes the most relentless accuser, drives you away from God reminding you of your unworthiness, uncleanness, and guilt before God unceasingly. Uh, I'll give you one example about how Satan does this in our time. So, so, uh, Satan, I think, is the great encourager and tempter, for example, before the woman steps into the abortion clinic, giving all sorts of justification why she should do so. She should go ahead with the abortion. But on the way out, he is the worst accuser. He turns everything around and makes you be drowned in discouragement and guilt and your sins without nowhere to return. 
uh, or, or to use another example, uh, uh, Satan is the great encourager before you step your foot into the brothel or click that button on your screen for a hookup. But on the way out, he is the most relentless accuser. Now, please excuse the graphic and sensitive nature of the illustrations that I'm using. I I've thought about this, but silencing the conversation, I realize, is Satan's tactics. A and we ought to let the truth be spoken and let God's word uh, challenge us and inform us in this matter. That's, that's why I, I thought. I thought hard about it, and I thought I decided that I'll use this example. Satan deceives, tempts, and leads people into sinning, but once they are fallen, he accuses them day in and day out so that people will drown in discouragement of self-hatred and self-loathing and guilt and shame and regret and ultimately despair, paralyzed to do anything and feeling unworthy ever to come before God. And that's what Satan sought to do with Joshua the high priest in this incident. And he would, have had med he would have had a lot of material to make Joshua feel really guilty and paralyzed with fear. Now we are given more information about Satan's accusation on this occasion in verse 3. Now Joshua, the narrator gives a bit of offline information here, I was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments. Satan seems to have had a plenty of evidence to support his accusation since Joshua appears standing before God with filthy clothes. Now, if you read the Old Testament, you'd know high priests had to wear clean clothes. They had to actually wash themselves, set apart themselves from everything else before entering into God's presence to do what is his duty? But here Joshua is clothed with filthy garments. The word is used elsewhere in the Old Testament to talk about a human vomit or excrement. Satan may be a liar, but on this occasion his accusation contains truth. Joshua is unclean before the Lord. Did you notice, in fact, Joshua stays silent and passive and quiet throughout, all, throughout this passage altogether. He knows this. Joshua's filthy garment symbolizes the nation's sin before God, and he can say nothing in his own defense. Joshua cannot say anything to what Satan is accusing him of. And that is true of you and I also, on our own, we really have no merits to commend ourselves before God. We have all done, said, and thought unclean, abominable, disgusting, and shameful things in our corrupt and sinful hearts. On our own, we cannot defend ourselves against the Satan's charge, but Wonderfully so, there was another who had words for this occasion, namely the angel of the Lord in verse 2. Now, angel of the Lord is a mysterious figure in the Old Testament. Uh, as the name angel indicates, and the word angel means messenger, someone who speaks on behalf of the Lord. So an angel is someone who delivers the Lord's message. But at times, the angel is so closely aligned to the Lord it's very difficult to distinguish whether it is someone else or the Lord himself who is speaking. So here uh, we are told he is the messenger of the Lord, uh, but the Lord speaks in verse 2. Yet the Lord speaks in third person. So looking at verses 1 and 2, the angel of the Lord is distinct from the Lord, yet he cannot be separate from the Lord. So for this reason, some people see the angel of the Lord as a bit of a prefigure of Jesus Christ. Uh, in the Old Testament scene. The angel speaks on behalf of the filthy Joshua in verse 2 and says, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. Or we might want to translate it as, Shut up, Satan. What a comfort to see that we have a defender and an advocate in the heavenly realm. But listen carefully at the reasons for his rebuke. The Lord rebukes Satan not because Joshua is innocent, right? He's not saying, shut up, Satan, he's innocent. He doesn't say that. Shut up, Satan, he's not unclean. Now, what he says, rather, shut up, Satan, Lord rebukes you because the Lord has chosen Jerusalem. 
It's almost that he's saying, shut up because the Lord loves loves them. Lord loves these sinful, unclean people. Lord rebukes you on the basis of his election. God forgives and wills these dirty people and restore them and purify them. Uh, I remember reading one of the quotes from, uh, I can't remember the source, but reading from one of the theologians, and it stuck with me ever since. And he said that the most difficult question to answer in life is to wake up every morning and wonder, how could God love a such a sinner like I am? And I wonder whether Joshua felt like that when he listened to this vision. God's choice to love his people never depended on their own inherent worth or on his undeserved loving kindness. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul tells us what God has done for us in these words in Ephesians chapter 1. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace. It's nothing about you and my worth or our merits there, is there? In love, just out of his sheer love, he predestined you. Not, not prevision what you're going to do, no, predestined you, despite all that uncleanness that is in you. And according to his glorious grace, according to the purpose of his will, he decided to adopt you to himself. It's as though God is saying, I love you because I have chosen you, and I choose you because I love you. (laughs) Wonder of his love. And having chosen and predestined us in his love, God wills to finish his work. His work in us will not be stopped by our sin. God's love is greater than our sin can ever be. Now, the Lord gives another reason for rebuking Satan at the end of verse 2. He says, is not this a brand plucked from fire? Uh, the phrase is an echo of Amos chapter 4, verse 11, which tells of uh, the Israelites who escaped God's judgment like a, a stick that was burning. And it, they were about to be burnt up, but God saved them. That, that's the imagery of the brand here. Uh, here is God's purpose of will towards his people again. God doesn't ignore his people's sin. Guilt must be dealt with, yet his discipline does not end in condemnation. Rather, the fatherly discipline is for their restoration, transformation, and maturation. He wills to purify and save them from the wrath to come. That's what we see in, uh, with Joshua himself in verses 4 to 7. Yeah. After defending Joshua from Satan's accusation, the Lord cleanses him in verse 4. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I'll clothe you with pure vestments. Uh, Just as the Lord uh, dressed Adam and Eve, even after they had thanklessly rejected God, here again God takes off. Joshua's filthy garment and dresses him in a wonderful, pure vestment. Uh, apparently, God is the best cleaner in the town. He, he can even uh, take away human excrements and vomit and makes it fragrant. Uh, he's the best fashion designer uh, that you've, know, you've ever known. He, he, he brings out of a human excrement and, and dresses and transforms Joshua as the most wonderfully decorated high priest. You read the Old Testament, you'd know how wonderful the high priest clothing and accessory and everything was. Now, how does God do this? Does God arbitrarily take away sin? No, once again, the New Testament teaches us that God cleanses our filth and robes us with Christ's righteousness. Now, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God clothes us with nothing less than by giving up of himself. He clothes us with himself by dwelling within our hearts by his spirit. 
And when Satan accuses us about our past guilt, shaming and casting doubt about our acceptance before God or your suitability to serve God, apparently this is what we ought to hear and perhaps say to Satan. Behold, I have taken away your iniquity. Now, the wonder of Joshua's cleansing could not contain prophet Zechariah. So, you know, he joins in verse 5. So it's a very um, comical scene in one sense. Jo suddenly, Zechariah comes and goes, don't forget the turban. He gets so excited. The high priest is finally getting reinstated. Nation sin is being cleansed. And we're going to see a beautiful, uh, a robed high priest in the presence of God. So Zechariah just shouts out, don't forget the turban. And why was the turban so important? If you read Exodus chapter 28, that was a vital part of the high priest's garment. You get the golden plate uh, written on, on the front of the turban was the word, holy to the Lord. In other words, belong to the Lord, acceptable before God, set apart for God, God's people, treasured possession. Uh, with the placement of the turban, Joshua's cleansing is completed and he is now given a new commission. So God saves his people for a purpose. God doesn't just save his people and then job finished. Uh, the order is important, however. God doesn't uh, save people on the basis of their works. But once God saves people, he calls them to do his work. As we read in the New Testament reading that Gareth read for us in Ephesians 2, by grace we have been saved, not, but, not because of your works, but once God saves, God says, well, walk in the good works that are prepared before you. And that's what God does here with Zechari um, um, Joshua the high priest. Verse 6, angel of the Lord solemnly assured Joshua, thus says the Lord of hosts, if you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have charge of my court. And I'll give you the right of access among those who are standing here. The exhortation to walk in my ways recalls the recurring motif in book of Deuteronomy. It's, it's, it's another way of saying, um, uh, remember the covenant. Remember how God saved you from Egypt and, for example, gave you the Ten Commandments and all the other laws. Well, walk in the newness of life in that way. If Joshua fulfills these conditions, the Lord promises him that he will govern the Lord's house and he'll have a right of access among those standing in the divine assembly. And that's an astonishing promise if you think about it. The high priest already had an enormous privilege to come into God's presence. He was one person out of the whole people of Israel who came as close to God as possible without dying. But God says to this high priest, well, you might come even closer to me. You're going to come close, as close as these heavenly angels are dwelling. This is, again, a repeated theme in Zechariah. God is not merely going to restore Israel back to what it was in the past, as great as that may have been. God is not taking them back to Solomon's days. God is taking them to something even better. God is building a better temple than Solomon ever built. That would have been really difficult for these people in Zechariah's time to imagine. How can, that, how can, you, be ever, how can you get better than Solomon's temple? But God promises Joshua here, there's something better. So building on this great promise, the angel of the Lord paints a glorious future with a promise of, I say, greater Joshua, greater high priest in verses 8 to 10. So verse 8 again, hear now, O Joshua the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you, for they are a man who are assigned. Behold, I will bring my servant branch. Now Joshua and his restored priesthood will become a sign of greater things to come, namely the coming of the branch. Now, what or who is this branch? Now, how are we meant to understand it? Now, when you encounter puzzling words like branch, especially in the Old Testament prophetic books, uh, it's very helpful to remember that Bible is not isolated book, but written in 66 books. Also, the Old Testament prophet Zechariah is written in the context of other prophets around. So looking at cross-references to other prophetic books helps you to determine its meaning. Uh, when you look at prophets such as Isaiah, 
uh, Ezekiel, um, Jeremiah, all of them use this language of branch or shoot. Uh, and they liken the house of David to a tree cut down. That, that's the imagery of exile. They were judged by God because of their sin. They were a tree, uh, you know, Psalm 1, a tree a flowing uh, next to the streams of river, but they've now been cut down because they stopped meditating upon God's word. But the great thing is, it's not fully demolished. It's got the little shoot in it. And from it will come a new branch. And that branch will bring in God's kingdom, greater things to come in the future, and it will even bless the whole nations. Uh, that's, that was the unified vision of all the prophets using the language of the branch. And the metaphor of a branch captures uh, three, at least very three important ideas. It expresses the idea of something new springing from what had been cut down. So in God's paradoxical wisdom, out of exile comes kingdom of heaven. Something akin to, in the New Testament we see, out of death comes resurrection from the dead. And secondly, uh, it expresses the idea of some measure of continuity between old and the new, assuring that the old will not be forgotten. As bad as the old is, that it had to be cut down right to the bottom, God's steadfast faithfulness will not simply let go of the old and start anew. God is committed, but God will transform it. And thirdly, it captures the idea of small or humble beginnings of the new growth, which at the same time will grow to produce something magnificent. Very suitable for this post exilic Zechariah community, right? And the next chapter, that famous phrase, do not despise the day of small things. From this humble temple, God's presence will fill the whole earth bit akin, once again, to the New Testament Gospels where Jesus talks about mustard seed. Mustard seed, the smallest seed in the Palestinian land, when it grows, one of the biggest, biggest tree where all the birds come and take nests. Humble sign into humongous reality. The branches coming, tells us, will bring complete cleansing of sin in a single day once and for all. Listen to verse 9 again. For behold, on the stone that I have set before Joshua, on a single stone with seven eyes, I will engrave its inscription, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of this land and slash this people in a single day. That God gives assurance of the branches coming uh, with another sign by setting the stone with seven eyes before Joshua, uh, commentators deb debate about the nature of this stone, whether this is the uh, foundation or temple stone uh, or it's something else. I think uh, it's rather the gemstone that's placed up on the high priest's uh, clothing. Uh, and I think that goes well with the context of the passage because passage has been talking about high priest clothing all along, his garment and then his turban. And now he's talking about the gemstone that went uh, on the high priest's garment. And, it's it as though every time Joshua put on his garment, he could see the inscription, probably written, I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. And he was assured of God's acceptance, God's promise, and went into God's promise to do, do his duty faithfully. Now the New Testament as you may have guessed, applies all of this to the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus had a humble beginning, born in a major. Then he appeared to have a contemptible land, cut off from this land, hung up on the tree. Yet he rose to the right hand of God where he reigns forever in glory. And by dying on the cross and rising from the dead, he took away the sins of the world in a single day, a single hour. As he said on the cross, it is finished. On our own, we are like Joshua and the people of Israel. We have gone astray from God and made ourselves unclean and corrupted. And listen to these words again. 
We were dead in our trespasses and our sins. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, and were by nature children of wrath. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, while we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. So now, having received God's mercy in Christ, we now walk in good works he has prepared for us, no longer following the heirs of this world, but living in service to God. And Zechariah 3 gives us uh, at least one good work that we ought to walk in as we wait for this full revelation of glory to come. And that is inviting others to know this grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 10. It says, In that day, every one of you will invite his neighbor to come under his vine and under his fig tree. For us, that day... Uh, uh, if you're using your Bible, you could even uh, write with a pencil, um, put an underline next to that day and say, in our day. Because of what Jesus has done for us. It's no, it's no longer in that day. In our day, every one of you will share with your neighbor and invite them to come under his vine and fig tree. Uh, that, that's a Jewish way of talking about heaven. That's why Jesus said in John chapter 1 uh, to Nathaniel, um, I like that story because my son is named Nathaniel, uh, he says to Nathaniel, Nathaniel, before you were in a uh, vine and fig tree, before Philip invited you to come to talk to me, I knew you. And at that, hearing that, Nathaniel goes, my Lord and my God, you're the son of God, Rabbi. As Nathaniel remembers Zechariah's promise, the time has come. The Messiah is about to bring in the kingdom of heaven. Well, that day has begun for us. And we now invite our neighbors. We ask everyone. All the people ridden with guilt and shame, sins, regret, dying and in this needy world to come and receive the grace and mercy from our merciful and faithful High Priest, Jesus Christ, who forever intercedes for us in the heavenly places. Well, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for our Lord Jesus Christ. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become your righteousness. We thank you for our forgiveness through him. Our Father, we pray especially for those of us who wrestle with persistent guilt and deep sense of regret and unworthiness because of our past sins. In our weakness, in times of our weaknesses and discouragements, please lift our eyes to see your love is more fierce, strong and greater than our sin can ever be. Help us to boldly approach your throne of grace and receive mercy that is ours through Jesus Christ. And Lord, now enable us to live in the newness of life through the power of your Spirit who lives in us and who forever guarantees and testifies to us that we are holy to the Lord, belong to you through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.